So we're going to have some fun today. Um, uh, so it, it is a little, uh, it, it seems a little strange that, uh, that I'm being asked to sub in for, uh, for Dr. Lustig. Um, and, and, oh yeah, I love it. I love it, Jerry. I love it. We like that. Your, your blood sugar is going down already. I love it. Your insulin sensitivity is going up. That's great. Um, so everybody remember this guy, right? 1988, right? You are no Jack Kennedy. Well, I am not going to pretend to be, uh, <laughs> Rob Lustig, okay? So um, let me just say a couple things about Dr. Lustig. This is Dr. Lustig. So uh, he's a pediatric endocrinologist and scientist. He's known around the, the country and really around the world for his work. Um, and uh, he does what I do. So I run the Countdown program here, which is our multidisciplinary uh, obesity treatment clinic. That's what Dr. Lustig does at University of California, San Francisco. Uh, his number of publications is tremendous, over, over 100 uh, over the last few decades, uh, more than 50 since 2000 on uh, obesity alone and neuroendocrine regulation of weight. And Jerry mentioned YouTube. And really, to do Rob justice, you, you really all should, on the way home, on the flight home, whatever, uh, pull up Rob's UCSF mini med school lecture. It has over 3 million YouTube hits which is really unbelievable because he gets into the nitty gritty of biochemistry in that talk. We're, I'm gonna give you a little bit of that today, but he really gets into it. So the fact that three million people sat through a very high level talk on biochemistry is, uh, is pretty amazing and I think speaks to what a fiery speaker he is. Uh, he's really incredible. So he, he's sort of hit the pop culture world. He's been on every talk show from Good Morning America to the Colbert Report. Um, and you know, for us in pediatric endocrinology, this is like having a rock star um, on our team. So he re you know, we consider him a pop culture icon. Um, so I'm going to present an ode to Dr. Lustig today. And it really, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so my mission is going to be to uh, relay some of the major points that he has uh, put forth about the causes and consequences of pediatric obesity. Um, and, uh, and if I am unconvincing today, uh, go to YouTube, watch that video with Dr. Lustig. Um, but, uh, but I think I'll do a pretty good job. And I'll say at the beginning here, I, I'm, I believe him, okay? I think he's right on. There's areas of controversy, and we're going to get into that, uh, but I think he's right. So I thought it would be fun to do this like going to school. So let's start in high school with a little bit of a history lesson. This may be actually the most important thing that we're going to talk about is the, is the underlying history here. Then we'll go to college. We'll have a course in biochemistry. And I don't mean to evoke any nightmares from people if uh, you have bad memories from medical school or, or professional school of biochemistry. Um, and then we'll go to medical school. We'll have a course in pediatrics. That's where we'll talk about metabolic syndrome a little bit. And then anybody recognize that guy on the bottom? So, you know, Jerry thinks I'm sought after. That, that picture is in Glamour and Cosmo. And if, if I ever hit that level, man, then, I, then I'm really cooking. Um, so we'll end with, uh, with clinical practice and a little bit of a discussion about what are we supposed to do about all this. So people who've heard me talk before know that I pr always present this slide. And I think it's absolutely critical for everyone to understand what's going on in this slide. I think it's critical for physicians and practitioners and patients and kids. The point is, obesity is complicated, right? It's not just one thing. It's many things. It's your genetics, right? If both your parents are overweight, good luck to you. It's going to be very difficult in the American food environment to have a normal weight. It's the environment. It's your mental health. It's your lifestyle. Your hormones get in the way. All these things work together to make obesity happen. Uh, and what I want you to think about as we go through this talk today is, am I right? Is this the right model of obesity? Should we really be thinking of it this way? Is it really this complicated, or is there something else that could be going on? So let's start with lesson one, our history lesson. So it's 1971, Richard Nixon, right, uh, facing re-election, okay? 
It's a, it's a tough time in America. We're in the throes of the Vietnam War. People are upset about that. It's threatening his presidency. Uh, and there's another issue as well, another domestic is issue, which is volatility of food prices and really skyrocketing prices of food. So the Nixon administration looks at this and says, you know, if we stabilize food prices, we'll have a better chance of getting Nixon reelected. So this gentleman, Earl Butts, becomes agriculture secretary in 1971. And he's a farm guy. He's from the Midwest. He's an academic uh, farm proponent, proponent of big industrial farms, and very tied into, very connected to the corn growers uh, in America. So what does he do? He starts a program where he's encouraging the massive production of corn in the United States, uh, add subsidies into that so that the farmers farming corn are becoming wealthy, growing huge amounts of corn, and it works. Food prices go down. They stabilize, okay? They come down, food gets cheaper, and uh, it works so well that by the mid-1970s, there's a surplus. So what do you do when there's a surplus? You've got to figure out what to do with all that corn. So Mr. Butts makes a trip to Japan. And why would he do that? The Japanese had developed a process for taking corn and turning it into something uh, that has very high sugar content, highly available sugar, high fructose corn syrup. So this is an industrial process. You use heat. You use acid, you use chemicals, and you wind up with a solution that is 90% fructose. And we'll talk about fructose as we move through the talk. This stuff is so potent, you can't work with it. It's hard to use in food. So you have to blend it with glucose, so it's blended. This high fructose corn syrup is blended, and you get high fructose corn syrup 42 which is 42% fructose, and you get high fructose corn syrup 55, which is 55% fructose. That's the one that's in most of the things uh, that we find in the grocery store, most of the things that we eat. And what's so great about this? Why would Mr. Butts go all the way to Japan to learn about this process and bring this technology to America? Well, it's because fructose is sweet. It's about 30% sweeter than sucrose. And it's cheap. There's all this corn around. So this highly potent stuff, high fructose corn syrup, becomes very inexpensive and uh, easy to put into all kinds of different foods. It's more soluble than sucrose. It's already in liquid form. So that makes it easy to use in the food industry. It's a liquid. It's more acidic than other available forms of sugar, too. That's nice, because things won't spoil as readily if they're a little bit acidic. So there's a little bit of a preservative property to it. It doesn't crystallize in solution. That's nice, too. So it's, it goes into a liquid beverage. It stays there. It doesn't crystallize out. Very desirable qualities if you're a food scientist looking to make uh, cheap food on a massive scale. It's a perfect substance. So any, has anyone ever tasted cornstarch? Anyone tasted cornstarch? Is it sweet? It's not sweet, right? No, it's not sweet at all. So you start off with something not sweet at all, and you end up with this you know, crack cocaine kind of version of <laughs> sugar, OK? Does anybody know, besides the endocrinologists and maybe geneticists in the room, does anybody know what we use uh, uh, cornstarch for in endocrinology? It's a medicine. It's a prescription. Cornstarch is a prescription for kids that have glycogen storage disease, which is a disease where your liver cannot release sugar in the way it's supposed to. So these kids overnight get hypoglycemic. They can't go through the night with normal blood sugars. So what do we do? We give them a prescription of uncooked cornstarch. That's their prescription. They take a tablespoon of this stuff, and it lasts all night long. The sugars are in such long chains and packaged in a way that makes it so difficult to digest that a tablespoon of this stuff lasts all night. 
long. How long do you think it takes to absorb a tablespoon of high fructose corn syrup 55? Right? Seconds. Right? Hits your GI tract and the whole thing, wham, hits your system in seconds. So the production of high, this technology I think is key. This history is key. And we'll talk later about, well, what's so bad about high fructose corn syrup? It's not all fructose. I just told you it's only 55% fructose. The problem is it's cheap. That's why it's bad. We'll talk about that more as we go. OK, so what happens when we introduce high fructose corn syrup into the market? This happens in the middle 1970s. And we love it, right? It's delicious. I always tell the kids right, that I work with, you know, if orange soda, I'm not saying it doesn't taste good. It does taste good. It tastes great. It's just not good for you. So we love this stuff, and it starts to be put into everything. It's the ideal compound to put into processed foods. It's stable on the shelf. It's cheap. The industry loves it. So our intake of high fructose corn syrup goes up and up. So this is data from the USDA. And I think what's interesting here is, sure, we were eating a lot of sugar before. This is dry weight. Depends on, weight depends on how you look at it, if it's liquid or dry weight. The point is that high fructose corn syrup consumption is going up. We were eating a fair amount of sugar anyway. Cane and beet sugar comes down. But what you should notice here is those lines don't cross. So you end up at a place where we're eating 60 to 65 pounds of each of those things per year, which is way over where we started from. And why would that be? Why are we eating more? So that's another question, I think, to think about as we go through the talk this morning. I think implicit in the fact that those lines don't cross is a clue about hypothalamic regulation of energy balance. And we'll come back to that. OK, here's something from the Yale Sustainable Food Project. And graphs like this you can find all over the place in various kinds of publications from the government, from academia, as high fructose corn syrup goes up as that consumption goes up, the percentage of overweight and obese adults mirrors that goes up as well. I'm not saying it's causation, but it's association that I don't think anyone would argue with, and we should take a careful look at it. OK, so what about fat? I think this is probably something that most of you are comfortable with and familiar with. This is kind of the last historical point that I think is very relevant. What happens in the 1980s? In the 1980s, we start to decipher cardiovascular disease risk factors, right? I, I remember this as a kid, my dad going for the first time to get his cholesterol checked. I remember in junior high school, which for me was 1987, having my cholesterol checked in school by the nurse at school. All the kids in my junior high school, they had their cholesterol checked. So, we're starting to figure out some links with cardiovascular disease risk. People knew about sugar. They knew that wasn't the greatest thing. But there was this war. Is it the fat or the sugar? Who came out as the bad guy in the 1980s? It was fat, right? Everybody should go on a low-fat diet. So there was this big push. We should lower total calories from fat from 40% to 30%. And by the way, slides in blue are from are right from Dr. Lustig. So a few of these I took from his slide deck, which he was gracious enough to share with us. So what happens? We, do, we accomplish the mission, right? We lower our total calories from fat. You got fat-free Twinkies, right? OK? So we, we accomplish this goal. But what happens to the prevalence of obesity right around the same time? It starts to go up. What's in a fat-free Twinkie? More sugar. Right? You take out the fat, you have to add more sugar. OK? So a couple smoking guns, I think, that we have here. OK, that's history. I think it's key. Maybe that's the end of the story. High fructose corn syrup is bad because it's cheap. And there were political forces that caused it to be cheap, cheap and they continue to this day. OK, so let's talk about biochemistry now. So we're going to move on to the second class biochemistry. Um, Dr. Lustig loves to talk about the first law of thermodynamics. And I remember learning about this stuff in 
high school and college and in my biophysical chemistry classes. I love this stuff. First law of thermodynamics is energy in a closed system is constant, okay? You might interpret that in a more simple way to say, well, if the energy's going in, you better burn it or you're going to store it. Calories in, calories out, right? It should be that simple. And I really challenge everyone on this one because when I came into residency and started fellowship, I believed this, right? It's what I learned in college. It's calories in, calories out. If these damn obese people would just start exercising more, they'd be fine. And if that's the case, obesity must be a personal choice. So this is something Dr. Lustig is really passionate about and is integrated into most of the talks that he gives. And I think he's right on the money. We don't get it. So this is a study uh, from uh, the Associated Press. Uh, and they have a group affiliated with the University of Chicago Public Opinion Survey. Well, what does it find? Most people, most Americans think that obesity is an individual's fault, okay? It's something individuals should deal with on their own. End of story. 52%. It's personal responsibility. We're still stuck on this idea. And I really would challenge all of you. I think a lot of physicians are still stuck on this idea as well. Now, I am not saying personal responsibility has nothing to do with it. It has a lot to do with it. We'll talk about that. And in some of the breakout sessions I'm going to do later, we'll talk about where personal responsibility plays a big role. And because this is pediatrics, really I'm talking about parental responsibility a lot of time. But I don't think that's all there is to the story. This is something we really have to, have to work with. Most, I would say anecdotally, this is true for me, I'd say it's higher than 52% among the countdown patients that I see in terms of families blaming themselves or the kids. I think it's more than that. OK, so now is when we get into the nitty gritty of biochemistry a little bit. And I think that one of the things that's central to Dr. Lustig's argument is that fructose is different. It's not the same as glucose and other sugars. It's metabolized in a different way. So I'm not going to go through the you know, probably half an hour, 45 minutes that he spends in some of his talks on going through the nitty gritty of this, but I'm going to point out some of the highlights. So this is a schematic of the metabolism of glucose. So glucose is the preferred fuel in the body. We all need glucose to live to survive. It's what we want. It's what our tissues want. It's what our liver is designed to deal with. So at the top there, glucose comes into the cell, and it comes into the hepatocyte through a transporter called GLUT2. And I don't want to be too technical here with, with genes and genetics, but I think there's a couple things that we need to highlight. GLUT2. I love GLUT2. So glucose comes into the cell through GLUT2. It's on the pancreas as well. Okay, it's the main transporter bringing sugar into the pancreatic beta cell, which is fundamental to everything. Okay, that's what triggers your insulin release is sugar coming into the pancreatic beta cell. So glucose comes in through GLUT2. I take care of the only kid I'm aware of, and, and colleagues around the country are aware of, who's the only kid in North America with GLUT2 deficiency. We can talk about that more later. So I, I have a special. Uh, special liking of GLUT2. So after glucose comes in, starts to be metabolized, and the main role of the liver, liver has two jobs. The liver has many jobs. Two of the main ones are to handle your sugar and to store it for when you're in between mealtime and you need sugar. And its job is also to process toxins too, right? Everybody knows that. So glucose comes into the hepatic cell, and most of it goes to glycogen. So glycogen is a long chain of sugar, and that's how your liver stores uh, the extra sugar that you've eaten. When you eat a meal, you don't need all that sugar right then. You need to store some of it away. So most of it goes to glycogen. That's the main pathway. Glycogen is safe. It's stable. Your liver, your liver can hold as much of it as it possibly can. It's not toxic. It's perfect, right? A little bit of the, the metabolic byproducts go down to the bottom there to citrate. So what's the big deal with citrate? Well, citrate goes through another metabolic cycle, ends up favoring production of VLDL. A little bit of VLDL goes to your fat cells, is stored away, 
as, as energy storage. Your fat cells make a little bit of leptin. Leptin goes to the brain, tells you, that's enough. I've had enough to eat, OK? Insulin signaling is involved here as well, right? Glucose comes in, insulin is released, and insulin helps the liver do its job and suppresses the liver making new sugar, which the liver can also do. OK? So that's what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to work that way. Now, I mentioned leptin. Leptin is key. And um, some of you who've seen me talk before may have heard me talk a little bit about leptin. There's many hormones that control energy and metabolism. I think leptin is one that we all should be uh, thinking of as one that's very important. So what happens if you take away leptin? You get the mouse on the left, OK? That's a leptin knockout mouse. There's no leptin in that mouse. That mouse has no way to know that it's had enough to eat. It's amazing if you think about it that our fat cells waste their time making a hormone that's only job is to go to the brain. I mean, that's incredible if you think about it. If that doesn't convince you that energy regulation is complex and involve the brain, I don't know what does. I mean, fat cells are an endocrine organ. It's absolutely critical. So leptin we love in Maine because it was co-discovered by Doug Coleman at Jackson Labs, which is the pretty picture of Bar Harbor there. And really, these guys are on, on deck for a Nobel Prize. I mean, this is a huge discovery. So leptin is absolutely key. And it works a little bit differently, probably, in different people. So here's a schematic of how it works in the brain. You see on the left there, leptin comes from the adipocytes, goes up to the ventromedial hypothalamus, and tells you that you're full. It's that visceral sensation that you're done eating. You've had enough, OK? We had a great discussion at Let's Go a couple weeks ago about hunger. What's hunger? OK? Think about it as thirst. What's thirst? You decide you're thirsty. OK, if I put you out in the Sahara Desert, would you decide you're thirsty after two minutes or 10 minutes or 25 minutes? You just feel it. You just feel thirsty. Hunger, sure. Hunger is a little more complicated. Emotions can play a role. But really, the true sense of hunger, you don't decide that. It's a signal. It's a CNS signal coming from the hypothalamus that you need to eat or you're full and you're done eating. So leptin is key. Leptin goes to the brain. If the leptin levels go up, this is how it's supposed to work. It means you're full. There's lots of leptin around. Your fat cells say, we're good. We've got plenty of energy. You don't need to eat anymore. It means your resting energy expenditure, REE, is high. And it's OK to turn the thermostat up. Okay? You can burn calories. We've got a lot of calories around. It's OK to burn. If the leptin levels are low, that's like a state of starvation. right? The signal to your body is eat more. You lower your resting energy expenditure. It's like turning the thermostat down. Keep the oil in the tank. OK, so how do you explain these guys? I love these guys, right? This was a couple of years ago now, but for a brief time, we had Shaquille O'Neal and Kevin Garnett on the same team. Pretty cool. Neither of these guys with Boston anymore. They're both seven feet tall. Kevin Garnett turns to the sides like a piece of paper. You can't see him. OK? Shaquille O'Neal is humongous. So how, is, he, is Shaquille O'Neal big boned? You know? No, his bones aren't any bigger than Kevin Garnett's bones. OK? What can explain this? Well, it's a myriad of factors, and this kind of stuff is still debated. We don't know everything about how leptin works, but people speculate maybe there's a leptin set point. So for Kevin Garnett, maybe he has a lower leptin set point. Leptin goes up a little bit, and it triggers his brain earlier in the process that, that's enough, KG. You're all done, man. No more eating. For Shaquille O'Neal, the leptin set point is higher. So he finishes that first portion, and those leptin signals aren't firing off quite as well. And he eats a little bit more, so he's a little bit of a bigger guy. Okay? Same NBA schedule. Probably they have the same dietitian on the Celtics, work out in the same room, you know, same workout room, same gym. You know, I mean, they're both NBA basketball players. How do you get one that's humongous and the other guy's like a piece of paper? There's metabolic forces at play that are beyond their control. So what about obesity? Obesity is leptin resistance. So if there's a set point, it's broken. You can't tell that you've had enough to eat. That set point is somewhere up in the stratosphere. 
So you need higher leptin levels to signal that hypothalamus that energy is sufficient. So even though there's a lot of leptin around, it's like your body is saying, eat more. Your resting energy expenditure is lower. It's like the thermostat is turned down. You keep the oil in the tank. OK. So what about fructose? So again, another one of Dr. Lustig's key arguments, and we can debate this. And if there's any biochemists in the room, we can debate it. Fructose is not glucose. Fructose is a five-membered ring, five-membered, five carbons. Glucose is six carbons. If anybody remembers their biochemistry, that makes a big difference, right? Shape of molecules, number of carbons makes a big difference, how they're metabolized. What happens to fructose? Remember I told you about GLUT2? I love GLUT2. Fructose can't go through GLUT2. It has to go through GLUT5. Okay? GLUT2, I told you, is on the pancreas. GLUT5, there's no GLUT5 on the pancreas. Pancreas can't see fructose. So where does fructose go? The only organ that has GLUT5 that can metabolize GLUT5 is the liver. So whereas some of the glucose that you eat, a lot of it actually, we'll look at it in the next slide, a lot of the glucose you eat goes directly to your tissues, is used directly by many of the cells in your body. Fructose, all of it, has to go to the liver. And what happens in the liver? Well, I told you about citrate, right? And citrate leads to production of VLDL and fat deposition. Well, the more fructose that goes into the liver, the more citrate that is produced. You'll notice something else. There's no glycogen here, right? Sugar's not going to glycogen in this step. Yes, a little fructose is metabolized to glucose, and some of that can go to glycogen, but that's a, a secondary process. There's no direct metabolism to glycogen. So citrate is produced in high amounts. VLDL goes up. Lipids go up. Inflammation is stimulated. Something else happens where you get increased production of uric acid, which inhibits nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide is a nice thing to have around. It lowers your, your blood pressure. So if you don't have that around, you get hypertension. OK? You starting to see how, how this works? And what Dr. Lustig's argument is here? OK? Obesity. I'm telling you hypertriglyceridemia. I'm telling you hypertension. So let's keep these things in mind as we move ahead. OK, I'm going to leave the biochemistry behind. It gets a little technical. Let's look at it in a different way. This is another one from uh, one of Dr. Lustig's publications. Let's look at equivalent amounts of 120 kilocalories. So bread, mostly glucose. So you eat that, very rapidly absorbed. As I just said, most of your body tissues use that up right away. Only 20% of it goes to the liver. And I showed you. On the slide of metabolism of glucose, you get some VLDL, but not much. Leptin is made, but not much. It works. Insulin is made, but not too much. It all works. And you get sugar storage in the form of glycogen, which is safe. It's stable. It's not toxic. OK, how about 8 ounces of juice, 120 kilocalories of juice? Well, if it's sucrose, half of that is fructose. Where does fructose go? Can't go directly into your tissues. It has to go through GLUT5. So 60% of that caloric intake goes to the liver. So what happens? You get high VLDL. You get more leptin. You get more insulin resistance. You get fatty liver disease. And then Dr. Lustig has become famous for drawing parallels between the metabolism of fructose and alcohol. So take 120 kilocalories of alcohol, shot of tequila. 96% of that goes to the liver. What does it do? It creates the same metabolic products that fructose does. You get high VLDL, high leptin, insulin resistance, and fatty liver disease. So fructose is a poison, right? Nobody would argue that alcohol is a poison. You don't give your kids alcohol. We regulate alcohol. We have laws about alcohol. We don't have any of that for sucrose, or for, for uh, fructose. Uh, but it, metabolically, they do very similar things. OK, so guess who doesn't like this idea? OK, the corn refiners don't like this idea. OK, so the Corn Refiner Association has this website, sweetsurprise.com. I love it. OK, they're going to re-educate the public. They don't like that high fructose corn syrup has been demonized and um, they went on a campaign. This was a couple of years ago. Some of you may know more about this than me. There was a campaign 
to rename high fructose corn syrup uh, corn sugar. Okay? Corn sugar has a nice ring to it, right? It's a vegetable. <laughs> okay? Let's just rename this stuff. Okay? FDA wouldn't allow it, which is, I think is great. Wouldn't allow the name change. Okay, so I thought it would be fun. Let's look at this. What does the science say about high fructose corn syrup? The idea that high fructose corn syrup is bad because it's not natural is simply incorrect. There's no difference between the fructose found in high fructose corn syrup and that derived from fruit. And for the record, table sugar is not natural either. I agree. Sucrose is half glucose, half fructose. So they're right, OK? They're just two different types of sugars. One is made from cornstarch, converted to fructose and glucose. The other one, table sugar, is sucrose. When the body consumes either, both get converted to glucose. I'm not sure I agree with that last part completely. Okay, In the end, it's the same. Well, I don't totally disagree. Whether it's table sugar or high fructose corn syrup, it's a lot of sugar. High fructose uh, corn syrup and table sugar both contain the same number of calories per gram. I agree. And, accounting, and according to multiple studies, are digested and metabolized similarly in humans. I agree. The question is, how are they metabolized? And how does that metabolism affect our health down the road? Just because a product contains an alternative to high fructose corn syrup, whether sugar, fruit juice, concentrate, brown syrup, agave nectar, which is 70% fructose, doesn't necessarily make it more healthful. I agree. It's bad stuff any way you slice it. Sucrose is a 50-50 mixture of glucose and high fructose corn syrup as at most 45-50 fire, so it should be the same. I agree, although we can argue that extra 5% over time, over one soft drink a day, that's going to add up. So I'm not sure that's totally correct, but I agree with the general premise there. The bottom line for most of us is that we need to reduce the amount of overall sweetener in our daily diets, regardless of what the source is. I agree with the corn growers. OK, here's a slide from Dr. Lustig. Some calories cause disease more than others. Hopefully, I've present, presented enough scientific evidence and enough mechanistic evidence to make you believe in that. And if you don't believe me, sit through the whole 45 minutes with Dr. Lustig online. Different calories are metabolized differently. Hopefully, I've convinced you of that. So what does that mean? It means a calorie is not a calorie. OK? Do total calories matter? Of course they do. I'm not saying total calories don't matter and that we need to mitigate our intake of calories. But are they all created equal? No. OK, let's go to, let's go to uh, the part three. So these next couple of parts I can go through pretty quickly. I know we're a little short on time, but I think we have till 9.30. So we may cut the Q&A short, but I'm around all day. Um, if we want to have further discussion. OK, so let's go to part three, pediatrics. So uh, what have we talked about so far? Obesity, hypertension, okay, insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia. What's that? It's metabolic syndrome, right? And that's where the money is. I don't really care about obesity, really. I care about the consequences of obesity. Our health care dollars are all going to go into metabolic syndrome. That's what we need to be thinking about. But when I was in residency, I learned no such thing as metabolic syndrome in pediatrics. We don't even know how to define it in adults, let alone kids. So maybe it's not such a useful thing to think about. And this is something that Dr. Lustig has been talking a lot about lately. And there's a nice review article in pediatrics if you want to read more about it. So what, what comes out of this is maybe BMI is not enough. 30% of obese adults are metabolically normal. What do we do with them? Somewhere between 5 and 40%, depending on the study you look at, of normal weight adults have metabolic syndrome. That's interesting, because everybody's eating the sugar. That high fructose corn syrup is everywhere. So shouldn't the skinny people be getting sick too? Looks like they are. What's common to all this? Well, it seems to be key that there's visceral adiposity, which means fat in organs not designed for it, and insulin resistance. So let's look quickly at another quick uh, uh, metabolic pathway. This is the liver again, and insulin working through the liver. When insulin stimulates the liver, usually on the left-hand side, you get suppression of gluconeogenesis, meaning the liver makes less sugar. And you get a 
picture where you're making more lipid because when insulin is around, your body goes into storage mode. So make more lipid and store it away. Well, in insulin resistance, it seems that something paradoxical happens. The inhibition on the left-hand side seems to break down, so you get more glucose production, which makes more insulin re uh, be released from the pancreas, and you get more insulin resistance. What seems to be funny is that on the right-hand side, that part works better. So you get more triglycerides and more propensity to dyslipidemia, the high triglycerides and low HDL profile that's typical of obesity. So something is wrong. Our livers are getting sick, and that may be the key to understanding the pathophysiology of metabolic syndromes. So does it exist in pediatrics? Yeah, it exists. I think it exists. I see it all the time. I see it every day in Countdown Clinic. What Dr. Lustig argues is that maybe we don't have to worry so much about specific cutoff points of triglycerides or A1C, but if you're seeing signs of pathology, that seem to be stemming from this hepatic insulin resistance get worried. In other words, high triglyceride, low HDL, acanthosis, which means there's insulin resistance, high A1C, hypertension, start to get worried. So Dr. Lustig has been on a crusade to reframe our debate about obesity. Obesity doesn't cause the metabolic syndrome, he argues. Maybe it's something else, but obesity is certainly a marker of the metabolic syndrome. And Maybe even it's a red herring. Maybe obesity is even a red herring, and everybody is at risk for metabolic syndrome. That gets even scarier. OK, so what do we do? Are we doing the right thing? Well, if we look at it from the liver's point of view, what should we do? We should reduce the total hepatic substrate. We should reduce the rate of hepatic absorption of sugar. And we should increase the amount we use the stuff. So let's go on to part four, clinical practice. And this I love. I love this. So in Dr. Lustig's clinic, he's a little bit more of a tough guy than I am. I am Jerry will tell you, I'm, sometimes I'm too nice to the kids. Dr. Lustig is a little more of a hardliner. So here's what he does in his clinic. They have four rules. First rule, eat carbohydrate with fiber. Why is that important? Well, if you eat carbohydrate with fiber, it gets absorbed more slowly. Fiber mitigates the absorption of, uh, of carbohydrate into the circulation. You have a better chance of feeling full. Your body has a better chance to process that carbohydrate in the right way. If you think about it evolutionarily, where do we get our fructose from? Fruit. Fructose is, you know, it's in fruit, right? It can't be that bad for you. How does it come from nature? It comes with fiber. It comes with a lot of fiber. OK, number two. I love this one. This is great. And I tell my patients about this. I say, I know a mean doctor on the West Coast. <laughs> and, and what he does is he makes you earn your screen time minute for minute with physical activity. You want to play video games for half an hour? You have to go out and play for half an hour first. You want to watch another half an hour? You have to go out and play for another half an hour. And that, it, he will admit, that's the hardest one to achieve. But what does it do? Increases substrate clearance. If your muscles are active, you're going to be using up that sugar before it has a chance to cause all those downstream problems in the liver. No sweet beverages in the house. That sounds familiar. Reducing the total substrate. This one I like too. This is his number four. Wait 20 minutes before a second portion. Okay. Give time for that satiety signal to register. Maybe if the kids are leptin resistant, they need a little more time for that. That's what I see in clinic as well. So does this look familiar to everybody? What is this? OK, it's what we do, right? Fruits and vegetables, two hours screen time. We're not as tough on the screen, on the screen time. I will we'll admit that, right? Two hours of TV time, one hour of activity. So you know, Lustig would want it to be two and two or one and one. Zero sugary drinks, we're, we're on the same page there. OK, what do we do uh, here in Maine? What do we do in the Countdown Clinic? We love 5210, but at Countdown, we take it to the next level. Four things we think is not enough. Four things is simple. It's good. It's a good message to stick to. But in Countdown, our kids, I think, need a little bit more. So we're just coming out with Next Steps, which is going to be published shortly by the AAP after a lengthy process. We've had great collaboration around the country on this work. So we've got 18 things. It's a little complex, but I think that I think that everyone would agree all these things are important. You know, how are you going to reduce the substrate if mom and dad don't know how to read a food label? 
how are you going to get them to wait 20 minutes between the second portion if the parenting skills are, are no good? Okay? So these things are, are all important as well, and we think the road to better liver health, less metabolic syndrome, is, is, has to involve all these things. Okay, what else can we do? This is great. I love this. So Joe Mazuv is the head of Children's Boston Endocrinology, one of my mentors. Great, fantastic scientist, wonderful mentor, uh, really so committed to learning and lifelong learning. For the holidays, he, gave, he always gives the endocrine fellows a subscription to the Atlantic Monthly. I never read the Atlantic Monthly until Joe gave me the, the gift. Okay, we, I still have it. So this comes in the mail you know, last month. This is what we should do. Just make healthy junk food. That's all, okay? That's all we need to do. So the author here, David, uh, David Friedman, argues that uh, we cannot expect all of America to eat fruits and vegetables five times a day. That's ridiculous, right? That's the food elite. And he also argues that our whole concept of wholesome food is getting off track. Now, you know, I agree with him on that. You walk into Whole Foods, man, right? I mean, come on. You know, you can go to the bakery and buy stuff that's just as bad for you as the stuff at McDonald's. You can buy stuff that's packaged with a healthy label on it that's just as loaded with calories and fat as the stuff from McDonald's. So I agree. Our concept of wholesome eating in the general public is a little bit deranged. So I'm part of the food elite, right? I have a CSA. I make enough money to buy healthy food. I put Swiss chard in my smoothie in the morning, OK? I'm part of the food elite. So a couple weeks ago, I was in the car with my grandmother. My grandmother is 95 years old. I drove her from Boston to Maine. So I had a couple hours in the car with my grandmother. She's pretty sharp. So I started asking her about you know, what was it like for her growing up. So she grew up in suburban Boston. It was the Depression. 10 kids, no money. She's poor. Her mom's got a little backyard. What does she do in the backyard? She grows fruits and vegetables in the backyard. They have a goat. They drink the goat milk. Okay? They cook every meal at home. They use the scarce resources they have to buy ingredients for home cooking. If my grandmother has a nickel and she goes to the corner store to buy candy, she gets smacked. Okay, she gets punished for buying something as trivial as candy with the extra nickel that the family has. Okay, so wait a second. She's part of the food elite. Okay, <laughs> right? She eats organic fruits and vegetables that she grew in her backyard. She makes every meal at home. She buys things from scratch. She's going to the farmer's market and she doesn't eat any sugar. She's in a kid with 10 families, one person working part-time, in a family with 10 kids, one person working part-time. It's the Great Depression, and she's part of the food elite. So I think, I mean, times have changed, but we have to figure out some way to make my nanny's model work in the modern day. What Mr. Friedman argues is that we can't do it. It's not possible. The food industry is best positioned to make this change. And if they started cutting down calories in their products and putting in more fiber, we'd be OK. He argues, and I can't help but think this is just to be sensational, he argues that processed food is not the issue. And I totally disagree with that. Our understanding of processed food may be deranged, but to be specific, processed carbohydrate without the fiber, that's the issue. And I don't think we can get around that by just making healthier junk food. We can argue that, and I don't argue that the food industry may be very well positioned to help us in this, in this challenge. They may very well be, and some of the things they uh, are doing are, are admirable, but I don't think it's going to be the whole solution. OK, so I'll wrap things up here. Looks like I'm not doing too bad for time. So causes of obesity, we looked at in the beginning, right? All these things raise the BMI. What if I'm wrong? What if Lustig is right? What if it's one obesogen that is the problem? What if it's the sugar? And again, I don't mean to demonize high fructose corn syrup. It's bad because it's cheap, but it's the same as table sugar. They're both bad. They're both poison. 
So what if it's the sugar? And as the sugar goes up, your liver gets sick, your hormones don't work, your leptin doesn't work, you don't know when you're full, you have these crazy cravings for food, so the demand for food quality goes down, you start to get depressed, your lifestyle starts to change, your parents get stressed out, they can't deal with you. There's genetic influences on top of that as well, as well, because mom and dad are obese. So maybe it's the other way around. So who is right, me or Lustig? Or are we both right? Are there elements of truth in both? OK. So the last slide uh, I'm showing on behalf of Rob. Uh, and Jerry was right. He really made a very noble effort to be here. But with his dad in ICU, we completely understand him not being here. So he has started an institute for responsible nutrition, a nonprofit, and he encouraged everyone at the end of the talk to visit the website. You can sign up for email alerts from him. He is a wonderful, uh, not only a, a rigorous scientist and, and good academician, but uh, an outstanding speaker and very convincing. So he offered his email to everyone, and I'm sharing that with you here as well. So that's all I have for you. Thank you very much.